Be sure to check out MythVisionPodcast.com. Help MythVision grow, guys. Become a Patreon member. You guys will get early access to all of my videos when I'm done editing them. Also, it's a small community where you guys can message me your questions and talk to me in private. You guys can donate also through PayPal. Join our social media links down in the description. We have Twitter and Facebook groups. Help the community of MythVision grow. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Hit that bell button so you're notified every time I do a live video and you don't miss any of my content. Like this video and comment your thoughts below because I want to know what you think about all of these things. We are myth vision welcome back your host derek lambert myth vision podcast i'm glad you guys are tuning into the show i have a gentleman named samuel zenner he's going to be joining me today and teaching me and you some controversial stuff we're going to be getting into uh josephus a little bit and uh he says he's not going to be preaching to the choir so if you guys are interested in uh, having your feathers ruffled and you're interested in new information that maybe you haven't heard before you're going to want to stay tuned. Do me a favor, go down in the description. You guys can help Myth Vision Podcast out in plenty of ways. If you're interested in helping us grow, hit that like button, make sure you share the content, but also down in the description, you guys can check out my friend Samuel Zinner's uh, academia.edu page. You guys go check it out. He's got tons of articles. He's written on this for many years. And in fact, to give you a little insight, before we go ahead and jump in and have him start taking over, uh, Dr. Robert M. Price said, there's a gentleman you need to get a hold of, you need to get in contact with, and that is Samuel Zinner. And he says, uh, this, this guy is like all sorts of information that uh, you can be trusted, that you, you really dig into source material, and you're critical, very critical, but also really trying to understand that I needed to get a hold of you. And therefore... I got a hold of you, and I'm glad that you responded. You're somewhere on another planet right now, from what I understand. And so, uh, <laughs> where are you located, That's Samuel? Right. And welcome to the channel. Thank you, Derek. Oh, I go back and forth, uh, not so much anymore because of the current international situation, but uh, I tend to go back and forth between uh, California, uh, but also Casablanca, uh, Morocco, and Tuscany, Italy. Uh, and so, yeah, right now I'm not in California, so bear with me if the signal drops out now and then uh, because the, the international distance between us. Okay, no problem. So let me ask you this. I've had a couple guys come on and we talk about the typical stuff with Josephus, but before we did the show, it seemed like um, you had some insight on connections between what we gather is the New Testament and Josephus, but maybe we should focus on just Josephus. Really, I'm at your mercy. I'm at your beck and call today. I want to learn from you what you have to present to us, and um, I'm just interested in hearing something that I haven't heard before in, in light of the information we've been uh, reading and studying for quite some time. So with that, if you would take us into... Um, Take us into the heretic land, if you will, and tell us some things. <laughs> I don't know if it's heretic land, but in any case, um, yeah, uh, one could approach Josephus right, just for Josephus' sake. Right? But I, I have a feeling, though, that a lot of your readers would be interested uh, you know, to hear about the connection between Josephus right, and, and the so-called New Testament. Um, but right, Josephus, yes, the... Uh, this subject is like the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? Where the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, were first discovered, there was uh, the first generation of scholarship, right? Had a heavy emphasis uh, from Christian scholars, mining the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? The texts uh, for evidence, right? Of the so-called Jewish background or backgrounds of Christianity. And so they were really appropriating this newfound Jewish, uh, these newfound Jewish sources uh, for really what's really uh, somewhat of an alien, well, not totally, but uh, you know, a, a, a totally different uh, field, right? So these are, these are Jewish documents. They do not, ex they were not written and they do not exist now for the sake of Christians who want to find uh, evidence that will confirm their own beliefs on a theological level. Not to say all scholars are doing that, but let's be frank. A lot of uh, biblical scholars are uh, trapped in, in that sort of paradigm, right? Because for two millennia, uh, 
uh, scholarship uh, has been in the control uh, of Christians, right? Just because of uh, how history turned out, right? And so uh, when you read biblical criticism uh, uh, and church history and theology, uh, you're going to find it full of anti-Judaic tropes, uh, even anti-Semitism, and that's a field uh, you know, that, that I also operated in as a Holocaust scholar, which is one of the reasons I'm very interested in uh, ancient Jewish literature and also the New Testament. Um, so it's the same thing. Josephus uh, was not written for the sake of Christians <laughs> and for Christians uh, to, to find evidence that, uh, that they're going to find comforting for whatever historical or theological reason. He, he was a, a Jewish priest. Uh, he he uh, wrote for Jews. Of course, he also wrote for a Greco-Roman uh, public. In fact, uh, we know from Josephus that right, he, he wrote two versions of his, of his main work. Right? The first version he wrote uh, in either Hebrew or Aramaic, right? but it was a Semitic tongue, and he wrote it for Jews. And I believe, and uh, a handful of other scholars do suspect that this so-called Slavonic Josephus preserves that first Semitic version of Josephus. However, there are many, many medieval uh, church Slavonic interpolations in, in that Slavonic version of Josephus. But uh, it's very easy, I think, to identify those medieval interpolations. Uh, but in any case, the second uh, version that Josephus wrote was then, and that's in Greek, again, Greco-Roman audience. Side of, uh, even by critical scholars, but it has important ramifications. You you broke up. You broke up. The Greek version was written for the the Greco-Roman audience. That's right. And then for it broke for out. a pagan audience, a Greco-Roman audience, a pagan audience, and so this is lost sight of uh, by even a lot of critical scholars because this has a direct impact on how uh, we are supposed to read and interpret. Uh, many of the passages, for instance, even the, the famous testimonium, right, Fabiano, the, the uh, paragraph of, uh, about Jesus, for instance. Uh, writing a paragraph like that, you're going to write it very differently uh, if you're addressing a Greco-Roman public who doesn't know anything about Judaism, basically, other than that, well, maybe there's that strange religion and they, they do the Sabbath thing and circumcision. Right, uh, and they're monotheists. But beyond that, they're not going to know what the what do you mean, Messiah? So you, you're not going uh, you, you're not going to go there. You're going to have to use other terminology. Right, and uh, this this has a lot of uh, impacts, right, and implications for understanding uh, some of these passages that. Uh, Many scholars, you hear them reading uh, the, the testimony, for instance, as if uh, it were addressing a Jewish audience. And so it doesn't make sense. And the entire thing must be uh, just fabricated. But it's been, to I can tell you, we, we can go through it if you want, but it's been totally misinterpreted and misunderstood right, by uh, critical scholarship, especially those scholars who just rejected uh, totally as a fabrication. Uh, personally, I think that yes, uh, Josephus did write something, right, uh, in the Greek version that we have, right, in the Greek version of the Antiquities about Jesus. And what's interesting about that is, is the, many scholars have noticed this, but some downplay it. But if you look at the placement, right, where Josephus places it, this is not, I'm sorry to say, this is not where Christians would place an interpolation about Jesus. No matter what it said, no matter what it said about this Jesus, they would not place it there. Why? Because it's sandwiched in the entire context of discussions, rebels against the Roman Empire. 
So even the placement of it, right, you know, is this is not what Christians uh, would want, right? They would place it somewhere else, right? Now, uh, uh, here are the objections. Uh, uh, and first of all, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make my point and then justify it for you. Um, okay. I'll make my point, I'll be provocative, and then you, right? as a mythicist expert can come back uh, with I'm, me with all any possible objections and I'll answer them for you. I'm not, I'm, I'm actually agnostic by the way. I'm not, I don't know if there was or wasn't. I'm very open-minded to there being a Jesus by the way, but our audience, the expert can comment down below and tell us how you're wrong if you there will. You go. There you go. <laughs> all right, here's what I'm gonna tell you. All right. Okay. Uh, the, the testimonium Flaviano in its entirety, as we have it in the, in the received text, comes from Josephus. It's authentic. There's not a word that's interpolated in it. All right. What? Well, however, everything that Josephus says there has been misinterpreted, not only by Christian scholars, but by apologists uh, who are pro-Christian and by uh, mythicist apologists. It's been, it, it's been completely misunderstood by both. All right, uh, I'll give you the first example. This is, well, how in the world could Josephus, uh, uh, as a Jew, who's not a Christian, how could he, all right, he starts off the bat. Well, all right, uh, there was a certain man. First of all, the construction in Greek sort of has a negative, a possible negative connotation to it. Oh, there was a certain man at this time, right? What time? The times of all of these uh, seditionists, right, and rebels, right? against the Roman Empire. He was a certain man, Jesus, right? If I should call him a man, right? So the idea there is, well, what? Is he supposed to be some kind of uh, God? So this is, this is Christian uh, theology? That's not, not at all. The Greek idiom that Josephus uses, you can find it scattered throughout, right? Uh, pagan literature. This is a term that you use for individuals that can be considered either positive, it's a positive, you're saying something in a positive sense or in a negative sense. For instance, this term is used, uh, you know, for, for miracle workers, it's used for Pythagoras, but it's used of Pythagoras by people uh, who are ridiculing Pythagoras, right, for, for a lot of his esoteric beliefs. So if you can even call him a man, but what it is, it's a basic Greco-Roman trope that you apply to individuals who have some kind of reputation for the unusual, uh, for the wondrous, right? So it has nothing to do with, oh, well, you, you're, you're implying, well, I'm not gonna call him a man because he's God, right? So that's not it at all. Uh, if you think that's what he's saying, you're just ignorant of this pagan trope that you can find scattered throughout Greco-Roman pagan literature. Is not what he's saying at all. Now, uh, the other main uh, claim that people just say, well, how in the world could Josephus, being a Jew and he's not a Christian, say that uh, he was the Christ? This Jesus, he was the Christ. Again, uh, this has been totally misinterpreted. Uh, this, because this is not what Josephus says at all. Remember, he's not writing to Jews. He's writing to pagans. And he starts off and he says, uh, well, at that time, there was a certain man named Jesus. And then uh, some sentences later, he says, this is the one who's, who's called Christ. That's not, he's not saying, well, he was the Messiah. He's saying, this is the one that you Greeks have heard about whose name is Christ. Uh, uh, like HaMashiach in Hebrew. Back he's, up, he's back Hebrew. up. This, th this is the one whose name was called Christ, and then he broke out, sorry. Right, this is the one whose name was called Christ. And so the, what jo Josephus is, is writing this to pagans who know nothing about uh, the, the Jewish term Messiah, right, how Christos, right? Now Christians would understand that, but he, he's saying that, all right, this Jesus that I previously mentioned, to give you a clue, Right, you people who you, you pagans who are reading, this is the Christ. This is the one that everyone is going around calling Christ right now, right? In this Jesus movement. So he's using it as a personal name, not as a title. So it's not Hamashiach, right? Rendered in Greek, which, which is a title, the Messiah. To translate this, 
He translated as Christ is a personal name, and this is all that Josephus means. So he's giving them a clarification. This Jesus is the one that you're hearing everyone calling Christ, because that by then, towards the end of the first century, the common era had become a actual personal name, right? Largely out of right, a lot of ignorance, right? Because of these pagans who were converting that movement, uh, many of them would not have appreciated the Jewish right, uh, context, right, for what's Christos, right? It becomes a personal name, just like Buddha, right? Buddha was originally a title. He was the Buddha. His name was Siddhartha. But with time, right, Buddha actually becomes a personal name among his, his the Buddhists use this now as a personal name. And this is what happened in, in the early Christian movement. So uh, Louis Feldman, Right, has, has written and pointed out that if you, again, if you read the Greek text of Josephus, uh, right, in the testimonium, right, uh, and then if you read it with the correct audience in mind, you can see uh, how negative it actually comes off, and it's very negative, right? So, oh, well, yeah, this Jesus, he, who, uh, who, who's said to have done tens of thousands of wonders, this is just mockery. And he's, those who, uh, he's followed by those who, who accept the truth gladly. That's not what the Greek is saying. It's, it's implying these, it's, he's accepted by those who are gullible. Right? Who's gullible? Right? So anyway, you don't have to amend right, or change the Greek text right, to be able to get out of it a totally negative uh, statement. Uh, and it is had no admiration for any of those additionists. So, so if I might Not chime in, you. yeah, I was going to say this is, whoo, okay, first of all, this is, whoa. So what I find fascinating, and I'm not an expert at all in this, but I am so fascinated with this topic, okay? And it's not just the Josephus thing, like, like I really want to know what the Jesus character was, if he really existed, was he just an apocalyptic preacher? Was the guy some zealot, like, you know, a real Brandon type Jesus? Um, and, you know, I try to figure this out. But what I like about what you just brought up is the fact that, and I never really thought about this, I did not know to consider this, and I'm sure I can get some Josephus experts to comment on it. I'd like to know their thoughts as well, you know, to get their, I like to hear different views. But you're pointing out that there were two types of histories being written of the same thing. One is to that's the right. Jews and one is to the pagans, if you will. And that's right. why I think that's interesting is because that will change the context entirely on its purpose and how how to look at it. So you're starting off saying, guys, before we even get to the passage, we need to know how to look at this thing. Um, we can't look at the text we have right now and say to the Jews, because then to the Jews, of course, this this would fit a mythicist possible interpretation or some other form of ter interpretation that this is interpolated or something completely. Um, I don't know if you know Dave Allen, but uh, he's a guy who's on the Facebook groups that I'm in. He has a negative. He's tried to reconstruct a testimony in Flavinium that is more negative. And in it, he he points out some of Celsus's like issues with the church and things, and he's trying his best to kind of go to Tacitus and use Suetonius and Pliny, and he's trying to point out these guys, not Pliny, so so to speak, but these guys are saying that Jesus was a sophist, um, his followers were were pirates and 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 thieves and all these things, which is really interesting. And the church apologists, you know, Origen and others are trying to defend that. No, 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 he's not that. And I think, and I don't know, I'm speculating here, that there was some such character that was seditious looking in the eyes of the pagan world. And, and people who were gullible were buying into this movement and stuff. It's just I never thought to take what we have <laughs> and say, this is authentic and you should really check this out as is. Yes, you need to know the audience uh, that it, for whom it was written. Uh, in, in any case, right, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give you a citation you can all check out, but you have to be able to read German. But some uh, this point was really emphasized recently by in, in an article in the 2010 
uh, one of the uh, numbers of the 2010 journal Novum Testamentum right, uh, was written by Ulrich Victor, right, a scholar in Berlin, um, it, it, uh, arguing for the authenticity in a very similar way that I do. And, uh, but it's in German. Unfortunately, it's not been translated. I think that a lot of the discussion about Josephus, um, unfortunately, it reflects uh, scholarly uh, knowledge or less than scholar. If you're not a scholar, a lot of people who do talk about Josephus, if you check up their sources, it's probably going to be 99 to 100% in English. They don't know Russian sources, scholarly sources, German sources. French sources, Italian sources, and all of these are all of these are necessary if, if one wants to speak authoritatively about this subject. Plus, of course, you need to know Greek, right? <laughs> you need you. Uh, in any case, um, some of uh, 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 things when you take this approach, some things begin to fall into place. One of them is this: we know, I think, most scholars. Uh, are, are going to agree that the Luke's Book of Acts definitely reworks some passages from Josephus, uh, including uh, most famously a passage about the, the, the different uh, uh, ones that Josephus considered a pseudo messiahs, right? False claimants, false messianic claimants, they, who were all revolutionaries. And Luke reworks this early on in the book of Acts, right? He, he mentions uh, uh, Judah, right, the Galilean, and, and others, right? Thutis, right? The, the infamous Thutis of the famous. Now, all right, so it's generally agreed by New Testament scholars that, that Luke's Acts right, is, has knowledge right, uh, of the antiquities, Josephus' antiquities, which is mid 90s. Of the common era. All right, so if you accept the testimonial Flaviano right, as original, then all of a sudden, all right, now who was it? Uh, Gary uh, Goldberg, right, 1995 article in the Journal for the Study of the Pseudepigrapha, right, wrote that there is a literary connection between uh, in the the road to Emmaus, right? This famous. Uh, There's a literary connection. Uh, sorry. Between, between Luke's Emmaus episode and the Testimonium Flavianum. Hmm. There's a definite literary connection. There is there is an there is an idiomatic uh, 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 phrase that's used, and it's only attested in Luke uh, Luke's Emmaus episode and in the Testimonium Flavianum, and this is where. Josephus says, and he spent, referring to the resurrection, and he spent a third day among them, right, among his disciples, which makes no sense uh, as a Pauline Christian uh, language or interpolation. The, that was, as we can see in the Gospels, well, yeah, he died. Uh, Jesus is supposed to have died, and then he rose again on the third day. But Josephus says, now he spent a third day with his followers. And this is actually what Luke says. It's, it's the same idiom. So this, mm -hmm. there's actually, so what's happening there? Well, keep in mind, Luke quotes from Josephus in Acts. And just five or six chapters earlier, so-called, to, uh, towards the end of, his, of Luke's gospel, he's doing the same. He's just quoting from a different passage in Josephus. And where is that now? That from the testimonial, Flaviano. So uh, you see evidence already in the Gospel of Luke for the testimonium Flavianum already existing when Luke was writing. Right? And, uh, all right, so uh, the, the next step in this is when was Luke writing? Uh, this takes us now to John the Baptist, if you want to go there. Right. Uh, so to, to, to figure out more or less when Luke was writing, you, you have to uh, date Mark, which is the earliest gospel, right? And then Matthew comes next, and then Luke comes next, 
chronologically speaking. That's the majority opinion that, that I hold to. Right, and um, just to be uh, uh, upfront, uh, I'm not dogmatic on the issue of Q, but I'm very doubtful about Q. That's my personal opinion because if you, uh, I, I really am attracted to the arguments of, of Michael Golder, the late Michael Golder, um, his theory, which was, well, you look at Mark as the earliest gospel. All right, now if you turn to Matthew, what you can do is you can say, well, what Matthew has done is added material to Mark. He's re he rearranges things because I'm, any author, right, who's writing on a subject that's already been written on, that likes to likes to change things, right? So Matthew rearranges things chronologically. He rephrases, uh, uh, turns a phrase, and, and all of this. But uh, he he has his own sources, which I do believe that that Matthew had some sources, but it's just not cute. But he did have some sources that were not available to Mark. And this is how he fills out a lot of his gospel. Of course, he makes up a lot of it, just as the author uh, has the right to do right, for, uh, in a new work. Uh, then Luke comes along. If you look at Luke, what Luke looks like to me is that Luke now has Mark and Matthew at hand and basically follows Matthew's program. All right, got to have a birth, a birth narrative, a birth, a nativity story, right? And uh, then Matthew started the whole thing about resurrection story, so I got to have some of that too, right? Anyway, uh, so that's what uh, that's most plausible to me. Right? So, but I'm not dogmatic. I'm not going to say there was no cue, but uh, I lean towards Golder's paradigm, which is there was Mark. And then Matthew added to Mark, and Luke added to Mark uh, and Matthew. And then John comes even later, and I'm thoroughly convinced, and, and uh, I think anyone who really wants to be honest with themselves will recognize that, yes, John knows the synoptic gospels. Anyway, now, uh, how do we date Mark? Well, I think we can do it with the John the Baptist story. Now, how do we do this? Uh, now, my argument is, and I know even some mythicists are going to disagree with me on this, but I do believe that Mark's account of John the Baptist and his beheading is taken from uh, Josephus, is informed by Josephus' antiquities, which is mid-90s, right? Now, uh, so what, what are the objections to that? Well, one, one objection is, well, yeah, but uh, you see, Josephus, in his story of John the Baptizer, uh, uh, mentions Aretas, and Aretas is an important part of the story, uh, and this is not the case with Mark, right? Uh, the dating is off also. That's uh, one of the arguments I've heard. Well, with all due respect, and, and I do respect those objections, but on the other hand, uh, mythicists who, who, who have made those objections at the same time, I have no problem with saying, well, the Josephus story of Jesus uh, ben Ananas right, is the basis for the gospel story of Jesus of Nazareth's passion. Well, that's totally, I, mean, I, I actually do believe that's the case. However, I mean, it's almost 40 years off. There's no Pontius Pilate there. Right, so it's a sort of a double standard. If if you're not if if you're going to accept the Jesus been Ananus story as an as an influence on the Gospels story of Jesus' passion, uh, then there's really uh, there's there's no valid reason, methodological reason, not to accept that Mark could have taken the John the Baptist story from uh, Josephus' antiquities. He just changed things around. Uh, what are some, another difference is Josephus says that uh, Herod had John the Baptist beheaded because he feared that John the Baptist could foment a rebellion. Well, Mark, of course, is not going to repeat that. He doesn't want anyone to know that uh, John, anyone in the Christian movement, some of the, the founders, John the Baptist, Jesus, would have had any uh, thing to do. Right, with, foment, with the possibility or even being perceived as fomenting uh, sedition, right? So of course he changes the reason why. 
Uh, but there's another clue that, that has been overlooked. And to my knowledge, uh, no one has picked up on this. Uh, I picked up on this, I don't know, many, many years ago uh, while, while reading Josephus. If you look at the 18th book of the Antiquities, two sentences in the Greek, two sentences before Josephus begins his John the Baptizer uh, paragraph, he talks about Tiberius, who has been informed by Herod against Aretas. So Herod is incensed at Aretas, and Herod informs Tiberius and tells Tiberius, I want Aretas beheaded. I want his head. So this is just two sentences before the story of John the Baptizer. Now, Josephus does not tell us how John the Baptizer was executed. We have no idea. He doesn't tell us he was beheaded. So my theory is that Mark has read the desired beheading of Aretas by Herod into the, his John the Baptizer story. And he just shifts it and applies it to John the Baptist. Uh, Matthew borrows the, the detail of John's beheading from Mark. Luke get, borrows it from Matthew and Mark. John does not mention it. Uh, the Quran does not mention the beheading of John the Baptizer. Uh, Mandaean sources, uh, which think very highly of John, Mandaeans have no clue. They have no idea about any beheading uh, tradition right, about, of John the Baptist. Uh, in any case, so if one wants to buy into that, then we would have to date Mark uh, at the earliest, uh, a little after the mid 90s. But I would think it would have to be a little bit later because it's not as if Mark was standing in line, right, for Josephus to publish his Antiquities, right, in 93, 94 of the Common Era and took it home and wrote his gospel the next day. No, it would have taken some time for things to incubate and to, for stories to be identified that could be used for reworking and paraphrasing. So, uh, I mean, that would be my guess, too. That would be my guess, too, Samuel, is that, you know, one of the interesting things to me, I always thought about when people try to date the Gospels and they go, well, we know he knows about the war. Um, so the war happened in 70 to 73. Uh, he wrote it in 74. It's like almost like really like the dust hasn't settled. I mean, guys, he's probably trying to the empire is trying to figure out how they're going to solve a lot of problems. I don't know if he'd even have the leisure of sitting down and writing at his desk and coming up with this extensive history. So I suspect a lot of stuff started to take place. And then once he wrote it, that needed to get out to the public or at least to the to the people who are well educated and read. And then from there, they would be able to decipher and come up with this mythology, if you will, a historical fiction about their Christ figure for their own movement. But I find it fascinating, and I wanted to touch on one thing before we end up moving forward, because I know you're going to keep going, um, that I think is important. Why would Mark, why would Matthew, why would Luke, why would John want to avoid the seditious movement? Look at what happened in 70. They know better than to have anything opposing Rome. They know not to have something at odds. They just had a cataclysmic apocalypse take place a few years prior. And in fact, I am prone to think and suggest that a lot of the prophetic statements in Mark, maybe Matthew, and even Luke gives a hint at it, doesn't really dwell too hard on it, gives this idea of a this huge cataclysmic issue with the temple's destruction and and with a war, if you will, that's coming. And so I think that that was such a monumental thing. Anyone in the right mind wouldn't say, oh, by the way, our, our Lord and master was, uh, he didn't like these guys and uh, yay, Jesus, the seditious leader. No, no, thank you. I doubt I'm going to get my head taken off by a Roman after what happened a few years ago. No, thank you. Let's rewrite this thing. Let's make sure. But the movement still survived after the war. Or do you think that the movement, or do you think the movement was created after the war. I don't know. I'm just throwing out an idea there. <laughs> no. Well, first of all, I would say, uh, even though I, I believe the Testimonium Flavianum uh, comes, all of it comes from Josephus, uh, as a historian, you can't say, well, there you go, that proves the historicity of Jesus, because this is 
near the end of the first century. So it doesn't, but it, it, it is important, I, I think, just for the sake of history, I mean, to get our facts straight, right? Well, yeah, there, there was this movement that did exist at that time. And uh, we can see how uh, at least the outlines of that movement from what Josephus is writing. Right. Uh, no, I, I, I do, I, I think that, uh, and I'm saying think, right? I don't claim to know, right? Because uh, in history uh, and in scholarship, you're dealing with degrees of probability and reconstruction of degrees and determinations of degrees of probability. Uh, you, not uh, uh, yes, or, uh, yes or no. And sometimes, yeah, I, I, yes, the, the, you might, historians might be able to, to deliver a yes or no. But in general, uh, on these topics, we're really talking about, well, what, how can we classify these different events, right, on scales of probability? Right. right? And so, you know, we, we want to know what was more probable. Uh, right, as opposed to less probable. Uh, that, that's all one can do. Uh, but my own personal viewpoint from my own research, is just for me, right, yeah, I, I do think that there uh, was a movement, right, uh, probably uh, from the 30s of the common era. Um, and Paul, um, Right, the, there's disagreement about, uh, you know, which letters in the New Testament are actually written by him. The, the, the main view, of course, as you know, is like, it's the golden seven, right? There are seven undisputed letters. Um, I would say that you could probably whittle that down to maybe five, because the, the, in former times, at least, there was a lot of doubt about Philippians, especially on the part of, of uh, Jewish uh, authors. You know, Leo Beck, the, the famous uh, theologian, Jewish philosopher who, who survived the Holocaust, uh, wrote an essay uh, where he addressed this question. Also, I think that uh, there's a lot to be said for the, the point that, well, if you're going to say that Second Thessalonians is apocryphal or, or pseudepigraphical, you should be consistent and lump First Thessalonians together with that. So I think either both of them have to be uh, authentic or they both have to be inauthentic, right? And so I, I sort of lean, lean towards the, uh, that, right? That they're, pro they're probably both inauthentic, written by some dis two different disciples of Paul. Interesting. Uh, the First Thessalonians uh, d doesn't resemble anything in the rest of the Pauline letters. There's no doctrine of you know, faith and grace. And all that. Um, in any case, <clears throat> uh, so yes, I do think that um, uh, there was this Paul uh, writing in the, in the 40s, uh, early 50s, and he came into conflict with uh, popularly known as James the Just or, or Jacob you know, Jacob the, the Righteous, who, who I personally think was Jesus' brother. Uh, but th that, go, that takes you into the whole subject of uh, so-called Jewish Christianity, right? Which, which we can go there. No, uh, no, no. We'll save those uh, for other shows. Um, we'll save those for other shows. Well, I, I'm just telling you. Uh, I'm just being upfront. I'm telling you that that's uh, you know that's my personal viewpoint based on my research of several decades. I know other scholars who have done research for as many, if not more, decades who come to different opinions. That's fine. Uh, but I'm just telling you, uh, you know, what, what I've uh, come to. Yeah, that's uh, perfect. So, it, right. So if Mark is about 100 of, uh, the, common, uh, 100 of the common era, uh, right, then Matthew and Luke have to be later. Uh, and, and uh, you know, have to be suspense. I know Dennis McDonald dates uh, Luke uh, to about roughly 115 or so of the common era. I know he said 120 on the phone the other day when I called him. So, <laughs> well, I said roughly, uh, roughly. Right? Yes, sir. So, uh, yeah, uh, in the ballpark, which makes sense. So, that means that uh, Luke is uh, uh, probably aware of the, the Kaifos Wars, right? 115, 117, Jewish, uh, re the second Jewish rebellion, if you will, scattered not uh, uh, against the Republic. This, 
technically speaking, the second war was really the Barcoa revolt, right, in the 130s. But there were these scattered, uh, but very devastating Jewish uprisings around, known as the Kaitos War, right, 115, 117 of the Common Era, which decimated uh, Jews uh, in, in Egypt. And Alexander, for instance, the final was from mm. just utterly devastating. So uh, Luke, right, is uh, writing uh, after all of that, right? So there's probably even a more of a renewed uh, poignancy, I guess, to the whole thing in the Gospels about the destruction of the temple, right, and the whole conflict that led up to 70 of the Common Era, right? So um, that just uh, reopening old wounds. Right, so, uh, but in any case, uh, so there you go. And then John, uh, I, I would date to uh, post Bar Kokhba uh, for various reasons, which I would certainly go into. There's an article, I don't know if it's been published yet, in the, the Journal of Higher Criticism on that subject, right, uh, trying to give the evidence for why uh, we should look at, why we should date John to, uh, as a post Bar Kokhba document. Um, of course, there are a lot of scholars like Dettering who would say even uh, Mark should be dated to after Barkovka. It's a possibility. Uh, I lean towards, uh, you know, nearer uh, uh, 100 to somewhere after that. Um, Let me ask you a question, uh, Samuel. Anyway, so I do think there was that movement, right? And the, the early phase of it was the, the tension and uh, the outright uh, animosity between Paul uh, and James. Um, yeah, let me yeah. ask you a question about um, the arguments I hear from a lot of people, such as Dr. Carrier and, and such, that will say, if the testimony of Flavinium exists, right, which this kind of flips the whole thing on its head when you point out some of the things that you've pointed out, they say stuff like, why didn't church fathers use this? evidence well i want to answer that with because, what i've already said because it's very very negative uh it's denigrating uh jesus right is from the beginning to the end so i want to work through that real quick with you because this is interesting they make the argument sure, that it's not there right and if what you're suggest, can you hear like feedback is there a negative feedback coming through uh, not on mine, but if you hear it, uh, I can turn down my audio a little. I wonder if it's me. No, I just wonder if it's me. Um, I'm just making sure it comes through for our audience there, to kind of get. Is that a little better now? Is that you, a little better now? You sounded now? fine. It was. I think it was me. Um, oh, so let, let me oh. take you through what I'm what I'm thinking in the arguments I've heard so far, and I don't know them exhaustively. Sure, sure. So they'll say what we were just talking about, and you'll point out. It's negative, duh. Why would you use an argument from something that doesn't show uh, shine a good light on your Lord? That's right. And it, the place where, as I say, the context is sandwiched between the whole history of these false messiahs of sedition. Right. So why do you want to bring attention to that if you're a Christian theologian? So technically, and what I, what I like about your argument is it actually pushes things earlier than having to go all the way to Eusebius. Because from what I, what I hear people say is Eusebius comes on the scene and he uses similar language. This is their argument that I've heard, and I, you probably know this way more exhaustively than me. Oh, yes, yes. I'm, I'm familiar the, with all the literature on this. They use Luke's – or Eusebius uses Luke's language – to interpolate that passage and place it in the place that it did, which is like, there's so many reasons to be skeptical of that. Like you said, why would you place it in the seditious section? Um, but even the, even the chronology and in other respects, a Christian will not put it there because when you read Josephus, then it would appear that uh, he, 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 he contradicts the gospel's chronology, which is John, dies first and then Jesus. But the chronology in Josephus, because of the placement of the testimonium, it does not agree with that. So that's not where Christians would have put an interpolation about Jesus. Mm. Interesting. So they didn't buy into that chronology. They had a different chronology in their in their four gospels. 
So in a sense, and I kind of want to end on this note and then ask this question, I think, is that, that the idea, the argument that mythicists do is they push it in the third, fourth century by saying, look, it wasn't invented till later. And why didn't they quote this amazing passage, which you point out isn't so amazing. Um, the other point I wanted to say is, if you look at this, this passage, the early church fathers, the patristic writers, Origen and others, which he's no longer a saint uh, for reasons we can go into a whole different show about. But well, technically, he's not a father of the church. Right, right. I mean, and he had some views that they definitely did not later on consider orthodox. But uh, uh, I wanted to ask you, these guys are fighting against people like Celsus. Can you give us a little insight on what you found? Like what... Do you think these guys like Kelsus see this and they're going, are you guys kidding me? Josephus tells us, uh, you know, do you not think that they see these sources or know about these sources? And they're looking at them going, you, you Christians, your leader's a sophist. Um, there's, you guys are a band of thieves. Uh, you're pirates, like Kelsus's argument and contra Kelsus with origin. Um, do you think some of these guys who are arguing against these fathers or these, these Christian apologists, are using this source in a negative way because that's what it is. Well, uh, one would have to go uh, on, a, on a case by case uh, study. Right. Uh, that hasn't um, occurred to me uh, before to look into a question like that. Uh, of course, uh, of course, Celsus, uh, the the negative uh, claims. That, that he has about Jesus, uh, uh, many of those uh, can be found right, in later, uh, attested in later forms in later Jewish sources, right, which I'm sure you're, you're familiar with, right? And, um, do you think they were found in those sources, or do you think those sources may have got them from Celsus? I guess because it's kind of well. You have to understand too. Celsus is, uh, you know, a, a, a real philosopher. I would say we wouldn't really expect uh, all, you know, all of these uh, Greek philosoph philosophers to have a copy of Josephus, for instance. <laughs> right. Um, it, uh, that uh, doesn't. I mean, why, why would they? Why? <laughs> I mean, sure, they have their Plato, uh, depending on the date, right? Later, and then, you know, Plotinus, Proclus, right? But uh, then earlier, that wasn't Neoplatonic, but the earlier Middle Platonic. I mean, they would have sources like that and, and Stoic writings and such. Um, why would someone like uh, Kelsen ha have a copy of Josephus on hand? Um, I would just think, I mean, maybe this is speculation, but I would just think that he would to argue against the Christians because he probably knew of a source that spoke about this issue if he's trying to take sure, him out. He, 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 does, he, he does well enough. Right. Uh, with or without Josephus, right, he, ha he had all of his main arguments, right? So then one more question I have before we end this episode, because we look, I sure, really want to sure. work with you more. I love this show. This conversation has been great. I'm sorry that the connection for those watching, it's a little in and out here and there. You guys, like I said, he's on Mars. Okay. He's on another planet right now. And it's, it's difficult to get the connection coming through. Um, it, that's, that's kind of uh, what happens, but I'm very, I value this. I cherish this information that you're bringing and one more question I have that comes to mind is this Crestus character. Um, is this a whole different seditious guy? I mean, you mentioned that a title can be attributed to the guy Buddha, for example, becomes his name. Christ becomes his name. Um, even though that was a title, um, he ends up being named this. And so Crestus and Tacitus, what is going on? I know this could take us into a whole nother show, but can you briefly um, give us an appetizer? Well, when I, this is uh, something where I would say the, there's a legitimate diversity of opinion on this among uh, Tacitus scholars. I would say that, for instance, you know, uh, Luke's Acts, where he mentions the expulsion uh, from Rome right, of Jews, I believe that he's uh, picking this up from from um, from from Suetonius, right, uh, 
because if you look at uh, well, let's see if you look at Tacitus, Suetonius, all this, it's 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 very interesting. The timing there fits with at least McDonald's uh, dating of Luke. So I think that they also have influenced Luke. So I, I can go that far. So uh, yes, there, there may be some relation between this uh, Crestus or Christus, right? Uh, and and um, uh, Christus. In, in Latin, maybe. Interesting, interesting. Well, sorry, I can't be more dogmatic about that. I don't want you to be. I, I mean, I'm, I'm glad just to hear opinions because that's what makes this so fun to me. I used to be a dogmatist, um, being a fundamentalist Christian. Then I was a staunch mythicist, and could I kept scratching my head, going, "How could anyone think this guy existed?" Well, that's what ignorance can do. And so I started to learn more and understand. And as I've been learning, as I'm currently doing right now, you're teaching me. I'm beginning to realize I'm not saying there was, and I'm not saying there wasn't. I'm not saying that there couldn't be a, a mythicist angle on this that makes sense, or even a composite of characters as G.A. Wells concluded his life in, and that he thinks there's something there like a composite, but he wasn't a staunch mythicist. Um, I am truly seeking to know what the options are, and I'm thankful that you don't go, oh, yeah, Crestus was him. He was running around in 50-something. The chronology is mistaken, and, da, 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 and here's the truth. I, I like people who do that too, but my point is just because someone comes across with an argument, I don't just believe it. I even tell Dr. Price this, and he wants to adopt me as his son. He says, you know, here's what I think, and then I say, you know what, I, I'm going to take what you say and be critical of what you say, Dr. Price, and he goes, please do. That's why I love you, and, and I was like, thank you because I don't – I'm not – going to follow anyone just because they seem authoritative or they sound good. I will consider their evidence, put it in my little uh, shelf of my research in my head. And then later down the road, I can make my own mind up on what I want to do. But um, thank you for this information so far. I never thought to okay, say a lot of these sources like Tacitus, uh, a lot of these ancient sources, historians like Tacitus, like Tonius, uh, modern readers and scholars, we, we have to avoid uh, hubris, or we have to be humble and recognize that actually there are some things that these ancient historians are writing about that we just are lacking the key to know what they're really uh, alluding to, that you know, a piece of the puzzle has gone missing. It was clear to them and to their readers at that time, but many points uh, will just be lost to us, and then uh, we're forced to, into you know, uh, uh, speculation right? uh, based uh, on uh, knowledge that we do have, and uh, try to come up with probability scales. Uh, but that's about for a lot of these questions. That's all that we can really do. Yes, sir. Well, if there's anything you'd like to say to an audience um, before we go, what would you like to say there, Samuel? Uh, well, I would say uh, I, I don't think it's uh, – those who follow my work, it's no mystery, right, the, uh, in, in the uh, tension uh, between the early Jesus movement and then the, uh, the, the uh, rabbinic movement that was sort of taking off at the time, rabbinic Judaism, uh, the, my sympathies – Right, uh, uh, lie with, with the, the former, and uh, I would say that you know when when one talks about uh, for me the, the term myth right, uh, does not have a pejorative uh, connotation for me. I used it simply in the etymological sense, right? In Greek, right? It's it's a narrative. These are stories. Of course, humans are storytelling animals, and. Uh, Right. If, if you're familiar with Talmudic uh, literature, uh, for instance, um, not everything that you read in there about uh, discussions of the different rabbis uh, is meant to be taken uh, in an historical sense. Uh, th these are, uh, and, and then Midrash and sacred legends, these are stories that are made up not to be read as history, but in order to inculcate ethics and morals or to get some theological point across. So I would say um, that even the gospels, for instance, uh, if, if everything is not historical, that, that doesn't have to, to be taken in a pejorative sense because I think that uh, some of what's going on there too 
right? Maybe, right? Uh, story. Uh, you look at the parables. Of course, this applies to 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 that to those. That's right. That stories are made up in order to uh, promote morals, ethics, sometimes to uh, get a certain theological uh, point across. And here, of course, you, uh, you, you can see the ecumenist in me is, is, is coming across, right? Because uh, for decades, I, I have been involved in, in ecumenical work. Um, so I have my own, my own uh, uh, personal views but you know, I try to be uh, you know charitable. I mean, Maimonides, right, was one of the greatest uh, 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 medieval Jewish theologians, Jewish authorities and jurists, right, believed that, for instance, Christianity, right, was a, a providential development, right. Even though uh, Jews don't accept all Christian claims, uh, you know, even Maimonides did see the hand of providence in his viewpoint. Uh, for this, because uh, this movement, um, even though uh, Jew Jews do not accept Jesus as Messiah, but th that movement, the Christian movement, brought monotheism to the nations, right? right. So uh, I, I try to be as charitable as I can, right, uh, on these issues. And it, even if you uh, one dates the Gospels late, as I do, uh, I'm not implying there's no uh, historical uh, bases to them. That's not what I'm implying. Uh, I, I just happen to be a historian and I like to work with all the little details. Yes, and, you do. Uh, date things and uh, right and, and uh, try to find parallels and sources and, and all of this. Uh, so uh, dating the Gospels is not a part of some ideological program on my part, right? To uh, uh, harm anyone's particular faith or whatever. Uh, it's just uh, as a historian, these things are, are uh, deeply intriguing uh, to me. Um, so. I have much respect for that. Thank you so much. Um, I know I can learn so much more and we will. I hope to have you join us again. Ladies and gentlemen, go down in the description. You guys can help out Samuel Zenner. Check out some of his stuff. Check out his articles. You definitely want to read him. This is a gentleman that Dr. Robert M. Price learns from and researches and, and really goes to find information. I mean, he's done a lot of studying. He continues to do this. He goes into the sources and you can tell he thinks very uh, critically about some of these ideas and so i really do appreciate you joining me today samuel and let's have you come back again let's talk about some other stuff and um i really do appreciate it that's all i can say sure, you're welcome it's my pleasure thank you and for those of you who are watching i don't know if cognitive dissonance plays a role if you have amnesia whether or not you just are telepathically leaving your mind but in case you do forget don't we are Mythvision.